may be seated. Luke chapter 18, beginning of verse 9, we read, Jesus told this parable to certain people who had convinced themselves that they were righteous and who looked on everyone else with disgust. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself with these words, God, I thank you that I'm not like everyone else, crooks, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to look toward heaven. Rather, he struck his chest and said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. I tell you, this person went down to his home justified rather than the Pharisee. All who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. This is the word of God for the people of God. One afternoon, a carpet layer had just finished installing carpet for a lady. He stepped out for a smoke, only to realize he had lost his cigarettes. After looking around, he noticed that in the middle of the room, under the carpet that he had just installed, was a bump. And he thought, oh, my cigarettes, no sense pulling up the entire floor for one pack of smokes. So he got out his mallet and he flattened the bump. Not long after, as he was cleaning up, the lady came in. Here, she said, handing him his pack of cigarettes. I found them in the hallway. Then she said, now if I could just find my pet parakeet. I, I know that's terrible, I'm sorry. We all make mistakes, and telling that was probably a mistake. (laughs) But some people never admit theirs, and they love to point out other people's mistakes. Jesus told this parable for them. The meaning of this parable is very clear on one level. Luke says that Jesus addressed this parable to some people who trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Obviously, the meaning of the parable is to correct the idea that we could be righteous before God and to keep us from looking down on one another. In other words, Jesus challenges our conceit and pride and encourages us to be humble. However, it is easy to miss the power of this parable. This would have been a shocking parable for Jesus' listeners. If you look up Pharisee in a modern dictionary, one of the common definitions is a hypocrite. But that is not how people saw the Pharisees in Jesus' day. The Pharisees were ordinary Jewish people who tried to live by the teachings of the Bible within normal everyday life. In fact, many scholars believe that Jesus was a Pharisee. That might explain why Jesus comes down so hard on the Pharisees if he was one. Perhaps he was being critical of his own group. In general, the Pharisees were the most honest and honorable people of Jesus' day. If you wanted to find an honest person to do business with in the first century, you'd find a Pharisee. He would be the kind of person that you'd like to sit by in church. You would want him to be the chair of your church council to be chair of your ethics committee. They were striving to follow the scripture in order to please God. In contrast, the tax collector was making no effort to follow the teachings of scripture. He was living for himself, living to make as much money as he could. In our society, a tax collector is not an evil person, perhaps not a popular person, but not evil. However, in first century Judaism, the tax collector was by definition a bad person. The tax collector was a person who was a traitor to his own people, his motive, money. The closest parallel that I can think of in our society would be gang members going from business to business in order to extort protection money. If a store owner does not pay up, 
the gang will come back and vandalize her store. Then if she doesn't pay up after that, the gang might come back and destroy her place of business or worse yet, do her bodily harm. That's close to what a tax collector did in Palestine for Rome, except they also went to residences as well as businesses, and they had the Roman army behind them. With the presence of a group of soldiers, tax collectors took money from their own people and gave it to the oppressive Roman government. The Pharisee was indeed a good person, a very good person, and the tax collector was an evil man. None of us would have wanted to associate with him. So you have a church-going, ethical, and moral person in the Pharisee, and the tax collector should have been in prison for all the things that he had done to his people. So we could try to imagine to hear this parable like someone standing in the crowd when Jesus first told it. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a good guy, a Pharisee. Yay! Yay! And the other, a bad guy, a tax collector, boo, hiss. Wait, what's a tax collector doing in the temple? Is he going to rob the place? Is he going to collect taxes from the temple treasury? Another way of stealing from us? The Pharisee stood and prayed about himself. I thank you, God, that I'm not like the bad people. Crooks, evildoers, adulterers, this tax collector... I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I receive. People were thinking, he's such a good man. This man takes God's law seriously. Everything he says to God is true. What a great man. I wish more people were like him. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He wouldn't even lift his eyes to look toward heaven. Rather, he beat his chest and said, God, show mercy to me, a sinner. You tax collectors have stolen and cheated us. What makes you think God will listen to you? Do you think God is going to forgive all the wrong that you've done just because you asked? You certainly don't deserve that. Then Jesus pulls the rug out from under his listeners. He said that the bad guy, the tax collector, went home justified in the eyes of God rather than the good guy, the Pharisee. How can that be? Jesus turns everything upside down. Jesus explains, all who lift themselves up will be brought low, and those who make themselves low will be lifted up. The Pharisee was doing his best to keep the law. That was good. God expects us to live good lives. His problem was that he was self-righteous and pointed the finger at other people who were not trying to please God. Isn't this a problem For all of us who try to be good and do good, as I reflected on this passage this week, I found myself thinking, I thank God I'm not like the Pharisee. I know I've made mistakes. I'm glad I'm not guilty of the sin of pride. I am thankful that I'm such a humble person. Pride is a problem for many of us. James Merritt tells about a fifth grader who came home from school so excited she had been voted prettiest girl in the class. The next day she was even more excited when she came home because the class had voted her the most likely to succeed. The next day she came home and told her mother that she won a third contest being voted the most popular. But the following day she came home extremely upset. Her mother said, what happened? Did you lose this time? She said, no. I won the vote again. What did they vote you this time? She said, most stuck up. Well, this Pharisee would have won that contest hands down. He had an I problem. Five times you will read the little pronoun I in these two verses. He was stoned on the drug of self. He suffered from two problems, inflation and deflation. He had an an inflated view of himself and a deflated view of God. His pride had made him too big for his spiritual britches, as my mother might have said. C.S. Lewis once said, A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, 
You can't see something that is above you. Lewis also recognized it in himself. He recounts that when he first started going to church, he disliked the hymns, which he considered to be fifth-rate poems set, set to sixth-rate music. But as he continued, he said, I realized that the hymns were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic side boots in the opposite pew. And then you realize that you aren't fit to clean those boots. It gets you out of your solitary conceit. I love the story of the encounter of Dwight L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon. They were the great preachers of the 19th century. Moody admired Spurgeon from a distance and looked forward to the opportunity of meeting him in London. On that historic day, Spurgeon answered the door with a big cigar in his mouth. Moody was aghast. How could you, a man of God, smoke that? Spurgeon took the cigar from his mouth, put his finger on Moody's big belly, and smiled and said, the same way you, a man of God, can be that fat. Because we are usually blind to our own vices, we are hardly qualified to judge others. But it is a common problem among those of us who are trying to be good. Pride is such an insidious disease that afflicts all of us. And those who can keep themselves in check tend to be spiritual giants among us. In the updated version of How to Win Friends and Influence People in the Digital Age, the author makes the point that the best influencers in the world are able to swallow their pride and listen to others. As an example, they point out that the Times invited prolific British writer and theologian G.K. Chesterton to write an essay on the subject, What's Wrong with the World? Some of you may know Chesterton from creating the priest detective Father Brown. Many theologians would have jumped at the chance to write about what's wrong with the world but Chesterton simply responded in a letter, Dear Sirs, I am, period. Sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. That captures the tax collector's attitude, the humble acknowledgement that we are the problem. We do not measure up. Before God, we, were, we are all sinners. The famous actor Gregory Peck was once standing in line with a friend waiting for a table in a crowded restaurant in Los Angeles. They'd been waiting for some time. The diners seemed to be enjoying eating and the line was not moving very fast. They weren't even close to the front of the line and Peck's friend became impatient and said to Gregory Peck, why don't you tell the maitre d' who you are? Gregory Peck responded, no. If you have to tell them who you are, then you aren't. That shows great wisdom and humility. But in our story, it doesn't matter what society thought of the Pharisee. No doubt, no doubt they admired him as a good man. And he certainly admired himself for his righteousness. But the only opinion that counts in the end is God's. And God tends to see things differently than we do. Perhaps you have heard the story of the man who came to the gates of heaven to be greeted by St. Peter. Peter asked the man if he can give a brief history of his life. He asked what good deeds that he had done throughout his life. And he warned him that in order to get into heaven to be admitted, you had to have 1,000 points. This will be a cinch, the man thought. I've been involved in church from the days of my youth. Then he begins to list his activities for Peter. He was an officer in his youth group, served in every possible position as a youngster, and then as an adult, he was on the church council and every committee of the church, engaged in every outreach the church had to help the people in their neighborhood, served on various charitable organization boards. He had, his list was extensive, very impressive. Peter smiles at the man, and the angel standing with him also smiled 
and nodded as he tallied the points and then whispered in Peter's ear. Peter tells the man, this is quite striking. We seldom see men who have done so much good. You'll be pleased to know that you have 327 points. Is there anything else that you can think of? The man begins to break into a cold sweat and begins to reach deep for every single act of kindness that he could think of. He listed them as the angel wrote furiously on his angelic clipboard and nodded his head in admiration. Peter looks at the clipboard and says, this is quite exceptional. You now have a total of 402 points. Can you think of anything else? The distressed guy strives to recall anything good that he's done in his life, like the time when he was young and he helped a little old lady across the street. He finally arrives at the grand total of 431 points. And then he cries out, I'm sunk. There's no hope for me. What more could I have done? Oh, Lord, all I can do is beg beg for your mercy. That, exclaims Peter, is worth 1,000 points. So also the tax collector in Jesus' parable finds his hope in the grace and mercy of God. And that is where we all find hope. Hope for our loved ones who have passed away and hope for ourselves. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the mercy you show us. We may pat ourselves on the back for all the good we do, but we acknowledge we could do more. We may say to ourselves, I'm a good person, but we admit we sometimes are selfish and sometimes even judgmental. We ask that you forgive us for all the ways we don't measure up to the standard you have set for us in Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the grace you offer us in Christ Jesus, whose life, death, and resurrection gives us hope for the present and hope for the future. Amen.